The potential of cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin in Africa is an issue we've talked about on the show quite a bit. And in fact, I've coined the term Bitcoin is for the other six and a half billion. It's something I feel very strongly about. Recently, Noel Jones, writing for one of our favorite blogs, the Genesis Block, wrote a great piece explaining how specifically Kenya would benefit immensely from such adoption, if only they knew. So, from the article. Kenya. Africa today has one of the fastest growing mobile phone markets in the world, with 20% annual growth and 93% of Kenyan households owning mobile phones. What makes Kenya a particularly unique case for Bitcoin is that it is also a world leader in mobile payment usage. In 2007, Safaricom, one of Kenya's leading telecommunication companies, launched a mobile payment service called M-Pesa, and something we've talked about quite a bit on, on this show. Back to the article. Today, two-thirds of Kenyans use the service, and more than 30% of Kenya's GDP flows through it. The benefits to the Kenyan population are astounding as well, with M-Pesa's rural adoption often seeing dramatic income increases after adopting the program. What do you guys think about M-Pesa Kenya and the opportunity for Bitcoin in those environments? M-Pesa seems to be working pretty well for a lot of people in Kenya and other parts of Africa. And perhaps it's because a lot of people have mobile phones and they're using basically this SMS-based mechanism to send small payments around. I think that they've already been used to this concept of using their phones to send money and to send small amounts of money. So perhaps Bitcoin would be excellent for them. You know, micro lending is another thing that I think of when I think of the developing world. And Bitcoin makes micro lending so super easy. It doesn't require these big websites and things to administrate. It's it's kind of just like you can make a fund and it's really easy to send payments to people and to pay it back. So so when you say micro lending, uh, let's let's actually talk about that for a second. What does that mean in a nutshell? Micro lending is basically the issuance of small loans to individuals or groups of borrowers in the developing world. Typically, most beneficiaries of micro lending are actually women or groups of women that are looking to start their own small businesses. Those loans can be backed by, for instance, people in the developed world. And there are many different variations and twists on it. Generally considered the first micro lending institution was this bank called Grameen Bank. And that was, oh gosh, Muhammad Yunus, I want to say, got the Nobel Peace Prize for Grameen Bank because they were doing these small loans. And that's the thing in the developing world because people don't usually have collateral. They don't usually have ways to get credit. They don't have a credit history. And so it's really challenging to think about issuing them a loan. But micro lending is specifically for those types of borrowers. And as far as having those loans be paid back without credit history or without collateral, which is people often don't have, lending to groups enables sort of like a social pressure kind of incentive to pay it back or like a, a group sort of assurance that the loan will be repaid. So it's really helped a lot of people in the developing world. I mean, there are definitely critics of it too, who say things like abusive husbands will like use their wives to get credit essentially, or like if they can't pay it back, sometimes like people will commit suicide and things like that. So it's got a couple of critics, but overall, I think a lot of people recognize that it has actually helped spur economic development in some places in the world where there weren't those options before micro lending came about. Do you know I, if I've, uh, anybody's doing this in the Bitcoin space yet? Because I mean, you're totally right. That seems like that's a really, really natural. Uh, that's a really natural venue. I'm involved in micro lending quite a bit. I've used uh, two services. One is more oriented towards peer-to-peer -peer lending, which is more the Western or developed world. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can find services like that on Lending Club and Prosper.com, etc. But in terms of micro lending, one of the services I use extensively for a big chunk of my savings is Kiva, K-I-V-A dot org. Me too. I <laughs> use Kiva too. So, Stephanie, you'll like this. I've started an effort to persuade Kiva to use Bitcoin. Yes. And, oh, and, great. Um, and I've sent them a number of emails. I haven't received a response back. I'm trying to create a little petition, perhaps on one of the petition sites, to persuade them to start accepting Bitcoin. There are some obvious significant advantages to using Bitcoin in that environment, including the fact that a big chunk of their cost is the aggregation and transfer of the funds uh, overseas uh, with wire transfers and things like that. They have to partner with these local intermediaries. Basically, Kiva is not peer-to-peer -peer lending. It's basically they broker, as I understand it, a loan that's given by a local bank, mm -hmm. but is funded or guaranteed by donors 
to Kiva. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And it's not necessarily about cutting out the intermediary because these local organizations, many of them charitable organizations as well, are responsible for distribution, for finding the borrowers, for helping the borrowers create a profile and tell their story and translating their story, et cetera, et cetera but also collecting the payments and being able to keep the system sustainable. Here's one very interesting thing. On Lending Club, I'm mostly lending to Americans. On Kiva, I'm mostly lending to people in developing countries who are much, much, much poorer. Guess who defaults more? The Americans? Yep. So the default... Oh, <laughs> interesting. The, the default rate on my Kiva loans is about half the rate on Lending Club, which, by the way, even the Lending Club default rate is quite low and it still gives me a fantastic return. Kiva, I don't get a return. It gets funneled back into charity so you don't make money off it. But it's really interesting. The default rate is much lower. That's an impressive testament to the fact that when you give opportunities like this to people who don't have the opportunities, together with the, the peer pressure of community loans and things like that, it's actually a very effective way to distribute and get money to where it's needed. Could Ripple be a medium for Bitcoin micro-lending? Or do you guys know of any specific websites that are only for Bitcoin micro-lending at this point in time? There's a lot of, uh, at least I've seen three different sites that do Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer lending, but none of them really micro-lending. And I think the big challenge there is a matter of having infrastructure partners who are able to distribute these loans, which is why I'm trying, rather than building it from scratch, essentially trying to get uh, Kiva.org to adopt Bitcoin, because they already have the infrastructure, the connections, and thousands and thousands of needy borrowers. It's much better to convert that. I'm real curious here. I do not participate in micro lending. Andreas, what type of amounts are you talking about on like a per loan basis? I mean, like when you're talking about the Kiva, are those, are we talking about like 50 bucks, a couple hundred dollars, a couple thousand dollars? The loans range from about $200 to about three or $4,000. Mm -hmm. uh, and usually the larger loans involve groups of borrowers. The uses of the loans range. At first you might be a bit surprised People may think that these loans are really kind of investment loans, like help Hussein buy a taxi so he can increase his taxi business or help Jimmy get a motorcycle so he can distribute cell phones to his customers or whatever. But a lot of it is also just plain old consumer loans, right? And if you think about it, consumer loans are just as important in this environment because they create liquidity. So sometimes it's help so-and-so buy a new TV and that's fine too. Individual lenders or funders can contribute as low as, I think, $25 increments on Kiva? Yeah, I do all of my loans. I have a limit of 25 is the maximum I'll do to any one lender. And then it's basically crowdsourced. So you have enough people dropping in $25 that the loans get funded pretty quickly, in mm -hmm. fact. So I just did some research on this real quick, and I searched for Bitcoin micro lending. There's actually a website called btcjam.com that is peer-to-peer -peer Bitcoin micro lending. And so basically, you can be a borrower or an investor. The borrowers can define like basically the parameters of the loan, like the interest rate they're willing to pay. There's an optional soft credit check and a peer-to-peer -peer reputation system that goes along with this. Investors get some perks as well, so that might be a uh, something that's coming out, but I hadn't heard about it yet. I've yep. used it. So oh. uh, I, I unfortunately have some bad news to, to offer there because okay. I, I, I have used BTC Jam and I, I find the concept and the, and the premise. Did you get yourself in a jam? <laughs> I got myself in a bit of a jam. I think the concept is brilliant. I think the execution is not quite there yet. So okay. my default rate on BTC Jam was 75%. Wow. Uh, that, that compares to 7% on Lending Club and about 3% on Kiva. Here's the problem. It's an anonymous currency. There's a soft credit check, as you said. Many of the accounts are linked only by meager information. So caveat emptor for sure. But at the same time, here's the problem. When one of those loans went default, there was absolutely nothing in terms of recourse. BTC right. Jam didn't even respond to emails. In fact, this is hilarious. You can't put a negative review against one of the borrowers unless you have sufficient reviews yourself as a borrower. Well, I'm not a borrower. I was a lender. <laughs> I had no reviews against my account, so I couldn't uh, essentially put a negative review against the people who had defaulted, and they went out and took out more loans. So, whoops. Oh, Badly wow. structured. But, well, I mean, look, thank the idea you for is sharing great. That. <laughs> thank you for sharing that experience. I think it's really important for people to know. 
I think I didn't have the greatest experience because it's still very much a beta attempt. And I wish them all the luck in the world if they can learn from those experiences and improve them. I was very much willing to lose that money. I probably put in maybe, I don't know, three or four Bitcoin, not a huge amount, just to try it out. I'm not upset about it. And in fact, I, I hope they're able to improve the service because it's a brilliant service that's absolutely needed in Bitcoin. It's like when you make a loan to your cousin, don't loan him anything that she wouldn't consider a gift. <laughs> Well, I can always track my cousin down and kick him in the nuts. That's true. You can't do that with a Bitcoin address. This is not a conversation I want to get into here, but I think that this leads to an interesting question. Does it even make sense to provide these loans in a deflationary currency? With that said, let's get back to the article. Despite having a robust mobile payment network with M-Pesa, Kenya is still subject to a slew of economic issues such as corruption, inflation, and remittance costs. Kenya faces high corruption, costing more than $1 billion per year, or approximately 3% of their GDP, with individual Kenyans paying an estimated 16 bribes per month. M-Pesa has not avoided this trend, with 114 cases of fraud in 2011 alone, resulting in millions lost. A protocol like Bitcoin, which removes vulnerability to human corruption, would likely be a welcome entrant into the world of mobile payments. And PESA also comes at a cost to its users, with Safaricom's fees ranging from 1 to 10% for money transfers. Users are losing value to a centralized entity with every transaction. On top of that, the Kenyan government recently began taxing M-Pesa transfers, which will further increase costs by 10%. Another substantial benefit that Bitcoin has over M-Pesa is with regards to inflation. Only in the last year, Kenya has somewhat stemmed inflation after reaching peak rates above 30% in 2008. Though concerns linger with regards to Bitcoin's volatility compared to developed market currencies, the relative consistency of Bitcoin could be a welcome change in less stable regions. I think there's a dangerous tendency for geeks to try to assume technological solutions to social problems. Uh, corruption is not a technology issue, it's an institutional and political issue. And it occurs because of widespread problems in a society and the lack of institutional controls to solve those problems. I've lived in corrupt societies. I know what it's like to pay bribes. And the problem is that when it becomes so entrenched into the culture, it's very difficult to resist even if you absolutely want to. You know, if you can't get your driver's license, even if you can pass the test and can drive well because the bribe is required. So, you know, you have to. You can't get a doctor's appointment unless you bribe the doctor. You can't get uh, your paperwork done unless you bribe the bureaucrat. So essentially you succumb to this pressure. Technology won't change that. You'll just bribe people in Bitcoin. In fact, if anything, it might make it easier because frictionless commerce also means frictionless bribes, right? I'm not necessarily convinced that technology is the solution here. But at the same time, I think Bitcoin would be a fantastic fit in many developing countries. Just like in PESA, it offers immediate person-to-person -person transactions with very little technology, perhaps, especially if we can adapt it to using SMS. The standard should be, can it work on a Nokia 2100, you know, a phone from 10 years ago? Because that's really the technology base in these countries. 16 bribes per month, though, per person. I mean, that's like... Nothing. That's a, really? I mean, that's, that's that's small. See, I have no concept of this. I'm totally, you know, I, I'm California born and raised. So, I mean, this is not yeah. something I have any experience with. That's that's a small amount for a country like this? Oh, yeah, absolutely. 16 bribes a month is nothing. I mean, if, if you go to India, it's probably 16 bribes a day. Seriously, this is the norm for the rest of the world. It's very easy to see things from a different perspective if you're born and raised here in the States. This is the norm for the rest of the world. This is what oils the machine of state. This is how bureaucracies work. And this is how most people in the developing world who have any measure of authority this is how they get paid this is their salary they don't make much getting paid by the government or by the fees they collect so essentially you have this entire shadow economy it's almost like tipping so the way tipping works in the u.s and most foreigners don't get it is oh wait you have to pay 20 percent on top of every payment for the service well that's not corruption but in other countries corruption works in exactly the same way you know you assume that people are not making much in on their government salary and therefore it's normal for them to collect a small extra fee it's almost like a tip and it's in the form of a bribe it's no different it's than that it's not like a tip it's not a tip is way more voluntary than something like a bribe. I mean, especially when it's backed by political force and pressure and the authority that these people have to oh, make you pay for it in some way if you don't pay them a bribe. You can't easily like leave a country, especially if you're born in the developing world and go to somewhere where there's not rampant bribery. 
However, you don't have to eat at a restaurant and pay a server a tip. Yes, that's true, except where it's not. Maybe this is different in other parts of the country, but here, most of the time, if you have more than six people in your party, there is a mandatory tip that is put onto your bill. So it might feel like it's voluntary because, hey, you know, you get to choose to pay it, but the option besides that is not paying your bill. So I don't really view it as a voluntary thing in that case. Nobody's holding a gun up to your head and saying, eat at this restaurant or eat at any restaurant, right? You have options for that. But they are holding a gun to your head and saying, fill out this paperwork and you're subject to my rules and you have to give me a bribe as well. So I think the only comparison you have with a tip, of course, coercion is a, is a big issue. But the comparison you have with a tip is that it's embedded in the culture and in all economic transactions. And you have to realize that these bribes are not just paid to the police or to the bureaucrat who's approving your application. They're, they're paid to every person involved in every transaction you make. You get your refrigerator repair person to come in, your meat supplier, your ophthalmologist, your kid's teacher, uh, your kid's soccer coach, whatever it might be. And they all take bribes. And in fact, bribes are how you do it. It's almost inevitable because people are not getting paid any other way. The bottom line here is that while it is completely corrosive by perverting all of the economic incentives and feedback loops for price, it's also so embedded in the culture that you can't really solve it with technology. People have tried. Certainly, there's entire movements in countries like India to fight corruption, and, and it's so difficult that even the people who want to fight it and are very much against it and committed to not paying bribes wears you down eventually. You know, you, you just can't function in that society without succumbing. So another thing is, of course, the fees, right? There's the 1% to 10% fee that's applied by Safaricom, which owns the technology and uh, that enables M-Pesa and basically is M-Pesa. But in addition to that, there's a 10% tax that's been put on these transactions by the Kenyan government, and also the Kenyan government routinely inflates their currency, because if I'm correct here, M-Pesa is not a currency unto itself, rather it's a transmission mechanism and like an, a kind of wallet for the local currency. Is that right? Yeah, that's, yeah. that's my understanding. If I understand where you're going with that, then... Bitcoin would at least provide a technological solution to the issue of inflation. Well, yeah, there's that part of it. But but actually, I'm looking at it from a different perspective. On this show, we spend a lot of time focusing on what the U.S. government is going to do about Bitcoin. But looking at a situation like Kenya, doesn't it seem like the Kenyan government is really, really, really going to hate Bitcoin because it provides competition? It's very difficult for them to tax. Again, it goes back to the competition thing, because by offering an alternative to a currency that is inflating at a substantial rate, it means that people are more likely to switch from the currency that's losing value to the currency that's gaining value and is cheaper to use overall. So, I mean, wouldn't, don't you think there's going to be some aggression coming from the Kenyan government if a change to like this was made? Absolutely. But I don't think that change is very easy. There's another issue that uh, we've kind of skirted, which is uh, M-Pesa or systems like that could be implemented throughout sub-Saharan Africa, throughout Southeast Asia. There's certainly a need for them. So why haven't they been? That's an interesting question. Why isn't M-Pesa being used more broadly? Why aren't similar systems being used more broadly throughout sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia? And the answer, I think, is, is rather instructive here. It has to do with two factors. One is that Safaricom had a very massive deployed base of users and therefore was able to introduce this simultaneously to a volume of users that was sufficient to sustain mm. a parallel economy from the get-go. So you have mass adoption at a level that's, that creates simultaneously enough buyers and sellers to launch a market. It's very difficult to do that chicken and egg solution where you simultaneously have enough buyers and sellers within the locality to make a currency viable. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why M-Pesa hasn't taken off in other countries or similar systems haven't taken off despite the efforts to do so. And it's also one of the reasons why I don't think Bitcoin adoption is that easy or will happen that fast in some of these countries. There's a lot of prerequisites that go into Bitcoin adoption uh, beyond just, hey, it's useful and I can put it on my cell phone. It's almost like you need mass awareness before you can even approach the question of adoption. Because if people don't know about it, then it almost doesn't matter for the initial users because it's not useful to them. Just like, you know, just like a language isn't useful if you're the only one that speaks it in your country. 
the network effect cuts both ways, which is if the network is too small, then there's no value added when you join it. And especially in the case of currency, the value of the currency is only based on the expectation that somebody else will be willing to accept it in a transaction. So that requires two things. It either requires a mass adoption where you are almost guaranteed that other parties will accept your transaction, or it requires you to adopt the currency for reasons other than transacting. And so with Bitcoin, what we saw is the first three years, the people who adopted Bitcoin were not really into it for transactions per se, or for the value per se, but more on ideological reasons. And that created sufficient volume and sufficient market growth, so then it could start attracting people who are interested in using it as a currency. You know, it's essentially a, a, an ideological political movement that turned into a currency. You can't really bootstrap it like that in a developing country because there are much more pragmatic considerations. So to finish up, we return to the Genesis Block article. Should widespread adoption actually occur within Kenya, the effects could be tremendous, not just for Kenyans, but for the Bitcoin market as well. In 2011, Kenya's GDP climbed over $33 billion, with mobile payments comprising some $10 billion of that figure. Bitcoin's current transaction volume is roughly $20 million per day, or just over $7 billion per year. If Bitcoin were to replace Kenya's mobile transactions, the Bitcoin market liquidity would more than double. To date, Kenya's Bitcoin adoption has been muted, with approximately 1,300 downloads in the country with 41 million people total. But with all the pieces set to align over the next few years, it's only a matter of time before Bitcoin and Kenya find one another. So do we think that this is inevitable? I mean, pretty clearly, there are advantages here. There are hurdles here. The conclusion here is that this is going to happen. What do we think about that? I doubt it very much. I think I think while Kenya is very promising, I've often expressed the fact that there are multiple preconditions for burst the adoption of Bitcoin. You need uh, technology, electricity, you need the uh, utility of the currency over your local currency, and you also need to not have fear of arrested or shot for holding Bitcoin. And all of those things really become a, a big equation where at some point it reaches a tipping point and you have mass adoption. I think it's far more likely that you might see localities within places like Cyprus and Argentina having burst the adoption where the technology infrastructure is more developed, there's more consistent electricity, and it's more compatible with people's adoption of technology in general. So I, I don't see Kenya as the first place to do it, despite M-Pesa. The model, I think, is right. But did anybody see M-Pesa coming out in Kenya? I mean, that sounds like something that sort of came out of the blue, perhaps. So maybe it could happen in Kenya. I'm not sure. I think it's interesting to think about what would happen if Bitcoin's market liquidity doubled. I mean, that's uh, pretty huge, and it really puts it in perspective just how many people are transacting and trading Bitcoins, or could be potentially in Kenya, every day. I think that would increase the value of Bitcoin quite a bit perhaps enrich some people in the developing world if they had gotten them early enough. I think that's a great suggestion, but the actual adoption of M-Pesa was anything but organic or grassroots. It was a planned adoption from the carrier that already had 75% of the market of mobile telephony in the country. They were able to essentially turn on a 75% uh, market share into a currency in one move. I think that would be a great model for adoption for other places or even Kenya. If some corporation that already has an established user base creates a Bitcoin derived currency or Bitcoin itself as either a rewards card or a in-app currency or an in-store currency or a loyalty card or something like that, and then from that basis bootstraps it as a general transactional currency, I think that's a good chance of happening. I really don't see how that kind of planned introduction bears to the grassroots organic adoption we've seen at Coin. The number I keep looking at is this 93% uh, of Kenyan households owning mobile phones. I think that you're right about it being a, both a planned rollout and about the people who have the ability to implement and roll out something similar in Bitcoin have almost no incentives to do it. And I think that that kind of is the core problem we're going to come to in a lot of these places. Anywhere there is a there is a monopoly on technology, like there is here, you know, it, where the vast majority of people are all on this same one Safari Com network, then that basically means that until there's an actual reason to change that it increases the profitability or offers some sort of advantage to the company rather than to the users, it's very, very unlikely it'll actually happen.
That's the other advantage for Safaricom is that they can charge a transactional fee. So why would they go to Bitcoin, uh, which would essentially remove their ability to tap into that flow of money? There is potentially a profit incentive for somebody if they can encourage people to adopt this technology that could really work out well for them as well. Not only would it provide an alternative to M-Pesa, which sounds like kind of monopolistic, actually, but it would also increase the market liquidity and therefore, I think, the value of Bitcoin. So uh, Bitcoiners have an incentive to help this happen, whether it's going to Africa and doing some activism or trying to get people interested in it or making some kind of app that somehow can run on older phones. I'm not exactly sure, but maybe someone will take up the mantle on that. Well, there are apps that run on older phones. There are a couple of services out there. One of them, I believe, is Phonacoin. And there have been some more that come out. They basically leverage SMS messaging, text messaging. Coinapult does that too, can send a coin by SMS. Yeah, exactly. So, no, I mean, I think you're right if we lived in a perfect world, but because we live in a world, I mean, clearly Safaricom doesn't have this monopoly there on technology, on these technologies, because the government hates them, right? They have it because they've partnered <laughs> with the government and they've they've enabled them to essentially tax partnered these transactions bribes. otherwise. Well, you know, I mean, it doesn't really matter what you call it. The point is, is that anytime you go into a situation where there's an entrenched power structure, like, for example, monopolies, uh, be they government, be they technology, uh, and you say, hey, what you're doing is great, but wouldn't it be better for your customers if you charge them less by using this more efficient technology? I bet you get major pushback in some types of cultures where it, there might be violent repercussions for you. So it's just something to keep in mind that change is great if it's change that benefits you. But a lot of times if it's benefiting you, it's at the expense of somebody else who's higher up the food chain. And that's not something that's real popular. So there's hope. <laughs> <laughs> If I showed you a website where you could easily purchase electronics from the world's largest distributor with bitcoins at 0% markup, would you think it was too good to be true? Good news, it's real and it's at bitcoinstore.com. Choose from half a million items, save money over Amazon and Newegg, and convert your bitcoins to real world items. You can even buy with privacy. All they need is a shipping address. But don't take my word for it. See for yourself at bitcoinstore.com.